In this lesson, we're going to look at uh, price controls. So price controls are artificial um, price settings created by the government. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that our supply, of supply and demand has been based on a perfectly competitive market. Um, so perfectly competitive markets have certain characteristics about them. The first of which is that there are lots of buyers and sellers within the market. Product being sold is virtually identical among producers, thus no one firm has an advantage. Firms can easily enter and exit the market, and consumers and producers are informed about prices. So what this means is that there are a huge number of people buying and selling. The object that's being bought and sold is identical, so if you think about corn as corn and it's not really different, firms can get in and get out as easily as they want, and really everyone understands what the price is. And so this leads to certain outcomes within a perfectly competitive market. The first of which is that no one buyer or seller has an impact on prices. Because the, I, the product is identical and because there's just so many people within the market, nobody actually affects the market when they enter or leave it. The second thing is, is that both consumers and producers accept the equilibrium price. Because of the fact that nobody can influence the price, whatever it is, is that's what they're taking. Okay, so let's look at price controls themselves. So remember that sometimes governments intervene in the market. One of the things that we talked about is our basic principles of economics. Um, when they do that, they're altering the market equilibrium where price and uh, quantity intersect. So the reason why price controls are created and the reason why they intervene would, the government would intervene within the market is to increase equity. So if we go back and we look at this uh, curve that we have here, this uh, production possibilities curve that we've, that we've used. When we look at it and compare efficiency and equity, what we notice, of course, is that a decrease in efficiency creates an increase in equity. And this is exactly what the government is attempting to do, is to make a market more equal, but in doing so, they actually decrease the efficiency. So thus, the government is changing the competitive market. So they're removing equilibrium as the price consumers and producers accept. Because remember, in a perfectly competitive market, Producers and consumers are accepting whatever the price is. In this case, the government is altering what the, what the price is going to be. So price controls are artificial prices created by the government, and they're designed to benefit either consumers or producers. So when we look at these price controls, there's two types that are employed by the government to generate greater equality. Uh, the first are price ceilings, and these are legal maximums at which a good or service can be sold. Ceilings are designed to keep prices low and thus benefit consumers. So when you look at a ceiling, this is as high as the price is going to get. So these will keep them low, and because low prices, of course, remember this, the lower the price, the greater the demand. These are gonna benefit our consumers. Floors, on the other hand, are minimums at which goods can be sold. So whenever you look at a price floor, these are designed to keep prices high because this is as low as that price can go. So when you look at price floors, these are benefiting firms because they're increasing the price and thus increasing the incentive to produce. So price controls are only binding when they prevent the price from actually reaching equilibrium. So there's a non-binding and there's a binding price floor in a price ceiling. So ceilings are only binding when they're below equilibrium, whereas floors are only binding when they are above equilibrium. So if the conditions above are not met, then the price controls are non-binding and they're, they're not going to have any sort of effect on the market. So remember that price controls are only affecting the market when they're actually binding and that binding is different for ceilings and floors. Okay, so we're gonna look in more detail uh, and we'll start by looking at price ceilings. So ceilings, of course, are legal maximums on goods which can be sold. Now, they're only binding when below equilibrium. We benefit consumers by keeping prices low and binding price signals create market shortages. So let's look at how that happens. We can bring our graph up and put our demand zero line and our supply zero. Remember the zero stands for this is the original line. So we've got our price ceiling here. So our price ceiling, we're at 550. But then we've got our equilibrium is located here and our quantity is here. So you'll notice that price ceiling right now is non-binding because it's above equilibrium. Now when that ceiling drops below equilibrium, now it is becoming binding. So when it's binding, we have certain effects that take place. So we'll look here. This point here is the amount that the producers are willing to supply. So when our price ceiling is say $2.60, they're only willing to supply 3.5. They're not gonna supply that equilibrium, which is just over five. But consumers are demanding over here on the other side at seven. 
So you'll notice there's a gap between these two points and that gap is going to represent a shortage within the market because of the fact that the government is not allowing price to reach its equilibrium point because they are altering that price and thus they are decreasing the efficiency. Okay, we'll look at it again this time looking at it um, on a side by side note. So when graph A shows a non-violating pricing, so we see that price at seven, we'll notice where our equilibrium is at. So when this, in this situation, the ceiling has no effect on the market because of course it's above equilibrium. Graph B shows the binding price ceiling with it being below equilibrium. So the ceiling is binding and market cannot reach equilibrium. So what happens are the results of this. So this lowered price increases consumer demand. Firms reduce production because of reduced incentives. There's no reason for them to want to produce at equilibrium because they can't legally, but at the same time, because price is low, reduces their incentives. So as a result, shortages develop as producers ration out the remaining supply. And discrimination can occur as firms are selective in their rationing. So when we look at it, so we see this first red line here. This represents the amount that producers are willing to produce at the price ceiling. You'll notice how much below equilibrium it is. Over here is the consumer demand. Now we can actually calculate and look exactly what the shortage is because all we have to do is the math. We take demand minus the supply and we'll notice there's a shortage of 300 in the market or 3,000 within the market. So quantity demanded is 7,000 whereas quantity supplied is 4,000. As a result, there's a shortage of 3,000 because of the binding price ceiling. So in an effort to make the product, the product more affordable to the population, they also prevent the pop, a portion of the population from actually even buying the product. So what we want to do next is let's look at a price ceiling in action. And we'll look at this OPEC oil embargo in 1973 as our case study. So OPEC stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They control the majority of the world's oil production. And they control prices through the expansion and reduction of supplies. You'll see the OPEC countries here in blue. So you'll notice these countries, a lot of them in Africa, Middle East, and then a couple there in South America. So those are OPEC member states. Okay, we want to look at the uh, historical context of this embargo. So October 6th of 1973, Egypt and Syria attack Israel in an effort to regain territory lost in the 1967 conflict. So they're trying to regain land. The attack takes place on the uh, Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur. You'll see it called the Yom Kippur War. And the U.S. and the U.K. provide military aid to Israel to prevent the attack from being successful. On the 17th, OPEC announces an oil embargo in response to aid to Israel. So basically what they're doing is they are halting all shipments of oil to the United States and to the U.K. So now what we want to do, of course, is look at this from a supply and demand perspective and see what happens. So this is not the actual lines, but basically we have supply and demand here. So what we're talking about is an embargo on oil. So we're talking about a change, a shift in supply. So supply is located where we have it now. What happens is supply shifts to the left. As a result, you'll notice equilibrium increases. So we have the oil embargo creates a shift to the left. And that's important to remember, supply shifts to the left, causing the price of oil to increase and you'll notice of course the supply of oil to decrease. So supply shifts significantly to the left as prices rise 70%. By December of 1973 prices have risen 130%. So we're talking about a significant increase in prices. Okay so let's take a look at the effect that this has uh, um, as our case study. So before October of 1973, the price ceiling on gasoline in the U.S. was non-binding. It had no effect on the economy. So you can see here from graph A, this is what the economy would have looked like uh, before October of 1973. So you have a price ceiling in place to prevent the price of gasoline from increasing too much. And as long as the shipments of oil are taking place, the price ceiling is non-binding. So you can see here where the price and quantity are below the ceiling. Now, when OPEC placed an embargo on crude oil shipments to the United States, the supply of gas shifted to the left due to the change in the input price. So when we look at it here, we've got our demand and we've got our supply and we've got our price ceiling. Now what's going to happen is when the, the supply of oil gets 
changed, it shifts to the left, it causes a change in the input price. And as a result, the price of gasoline rises. Now you'll notice what happens. So the price of gasoline rose from S0 to S1. So equilibrium changed. And you'll notice here with the shift to the left because of the change in input price. Now as a result, you can look here and what you'll see is a shortage develops. So you have QS, you have QD, you can see there's a huge shortage that develops for gasoline. So the price ceiling on gasoline becomes binding, resulting in a shortage within the economy for gasoline. So this is what happens as a result. So this is our case study. When we see this OPEC oil embargo, it causes the input prices to change, which means gasoline shifts to the left, creating a, a binding price ceiling on a previously non-binding market. So the embargo ended in March of 1974, but oil prices do not fall until pre-embargo prices until 1986. So in other words, this, the embargo has a significant decade effect on the United States. So when we look at our impacts, shortage of gas leads to long line at the pump, go figure. So we see here these pictures, gas shortage sales limited to 10 gallons of gas per customer. Sorry, no gasoline. So this is a pretty common occurrence within the United States. Also, speed limits were lowered in an effort to conserve gasoline. And then we also begin to see the importation of foreign-made cars, uh, Honda, Toyota, Nissan. So these cars are being imported. And at the same time, we see that the price ceiling on oil prices are repealed. Because if you think about it, if the price ceilings are repealed, then it doesn't matter how expensive it gets. We'll always be able to supply. It's just going to cost more and more money. So a second major example of the impact of price ceilings is that of rent controls. So during World War II, the U.S. government began enacting rent controls to keep housing prices low during the war. And rent controls still exist in large cities across the U.S. today. So their purpose is to make housing more affordable to larger numbers of people. So remember this increase in equity while decreasing efficiency. So rent controls act as a price ceiling. Equity is increased. Efficiency is decreased. Okay, so let's look at our market here. So we see supply is vertical, and you'll see demand. Now the reason supply is vertical is a pretty easy understanding. We see our rent control located here. So in the beginning, rent controls create a small shortage of apartments because you can't just build apartments quickly. So supply is vertical in the short run simply because it's not like you can just build apartments overnight. So in other words, in, those, in the immediate, we have this shortage that's not really big because of rent controls. So you'll notice here, so as a result, supply is a vertical line and the quantity supplied is 400 regardless of the price. So this results in a small shortage at first. Inefficiency develops not in the short run, but over the long run. So in other words, rent controls have a significant effect on the shortage in the long run. They do not have a huge effect in the short run, but rather over the long term of their usage. So what happens in the long run? So in the long run, you'll notice that the demand becomes more elastic. It, it, it stretches out more. And supply also becomes more elastic. So over time, there's no incentive to build new apartments or even maintain the current ones for tenants. So what happens, of course, in the long run is that the, the shortage becomes larger and larger. So, so we have here, but for buyers, the lower rents encourage people to look for apartments. As a result, the shortage over time for housing grows. So whereas originally we had a very small shortage, now we have a very large shortage because over time the demand for the housing increases, but the, the supply of housing does not increase because there's no real incentive to actually create new apartments because the price is too low. So how do these rent controls impact the economy and impact the people living in those areas? Well, the long-term impacts. The shortage of housing increases as demand for cheap housing rises incentive to build new housing is reduced and there's no incentive to maintain current housing because of the constant demand. So discrimination in the housing market occurs. Essentially, you've got a whole bunch of apartments that are not in good quality. You've got a whole lot of people trying to get in them and there's no reason to build new ones. So in other words, we end up with some very, very low income housing and discrimination in the market occurring because people don't, because the, the firms aren't wanting to just rent to anybody. They can be selective in who they want to rent to. So you have to remember this trade-off between equity and efficiency that occurs. So we have two possible market outcomes. Uh, one is black markets. People are willing to pay higher prices illegally to avoid discrimination and long wait times. 
And then we also have search activity as lengthened as renters spend longer times looking for available housing. So let's look at these uh, impacts here, what we saw with these black markets and search activity. So the opportunity cost involved in the rental, rental of housing is the rent, but also the value of the time spent searching for a place. Remember that the demand is very high, and so we end up with a shortage, and so people spend a lot of time looking to try to find a place to live. So if we put our supply and demand back up and we look at our rent control, one of the things we notice is we have this space here in between demand and the actual rent control and we're moving in a straight line down to quantity. So the range of black market rents or search cost is in this area here, um, moving downward where it crosses the supply at. So up to, you'll see seven and hundred, so 700. So essentially what we're saying here is that people would be willing to pay up to $700 to find a place to rent. So in other words, they would pay somewhere in between 700 to this $500. They would pay anywhere in that range if they could gain access to an apartment earlier than what would happen if they were waiting in line. So this is what buyers are willing to pay. And as a result, it may be cheaper to illegally pay above the rent control to save the time involved in a search. Remember time, of course, is an opportunity cost, is something of value to us. So people may be willing to pay above that rent control in order to actually get access to an apartment earlier. So this is the black market as a result of the search activity. So we see the quantity of housing available at the rent control is this number here. Let's just call this 225. So people are willing to pay more money so they don't have to stand in line to gain access to housing. So in other words, we get our black market. Okay, let's look at price floors now. So these are legal minimums at which goods can be sold. They're binding only when above equilibrium. They tend to benefit producers by generating higher revenues. Now I say that I tend to because they do not always generate uh, higher total revenue. Sometimes they can decrease them. It just depends on how big, but that's kind of is their point. Um, binding price floors create surpluses. Now those surpluses are counted against the total revenue as they involve a cost to produce. So even though price floors create a greater total revenue in most cases, they can actually cost producers profit because of the cost involved in producing those amounts that don't actually get sold. So when we look at them graphed, we'll see here we have supply and demand, we have our equilibrium, and we have a non-binding price floor because it's below equilibrium. Now when that price floor rises above equilibrium, now of course it becomes binding. And as a result, what we see here is we have a demand that is pretty low. So our demand is lower than equilibrium, but our supply is well above equilibrium. And as a result, we end up with a surplus between the two because now the incentive to produce has increased for suppliers but the demand of the buyers uh, has dropped because prices have increased. So this time we'll look at it side by side. So here's our non-binding price floor with a below equilibrium. And then when we look at a binding price floor, we see here that since the floor is below market equilibrium price, it has no effect on the market. And so in, in, in graph A, price floors are relevant. It doesn't matter at all. What happens, of course, is when we look at the binding price floors, we see that with price floor above equilibrium, now what we end up with is we end up with a surplus between quantity demand and quantity supplied. Because what we see here is a surplus of 3,000 because the supply is 3,000 above the demand of the uh, consumers here. So while quantity demanded is 4,000, quantity supplied is 7,000. So notice that binding price floors create surpluses because it increases the producer's incentive to supply goods and services, but it also reduces the quantity demanded for goods since the price increases. And as with price ceilings, binding price floors create inefficiency within the market. So in both ceilings and floors, when binding, they, they create an inefficient market. So as with the OPEC oil embargo and price ceilings, we'll do a case study here. In this case, we're going to do minimum wages. So up until 1938, there was no minimum wage within the United States. What it basically the market um, equilibrium was the, the wage and also the quantity of workers. And so wages were based on supply and demand for labor in the market. Now that of course meant that up till 1938, unemployment was actually fairly low except through the depression areas and panics when it would rise. So in 1938, President Roosevelt signed a minimum wage law into effect as part of the second new deal. And this was a program to combat the Great Depression. 
Uh, it set this original minimum wage at 35 cents an hour. Uh, minimum wage itself varies widely across the U.S. and some states have wages above the federal mandate. So if the federal mandate is say 7.25 an hour, they, that is what you have to pay, but states could actually bump that up to say 9.25 or even 9.50 an hour, maybe $10 an hour. So the wage was designed to increase the standard of living of the average American worker. So understand that minimum wages are price floors that are created to increase the standard of living. Now what we just learned about price floors, of course, is that they create surpluses. In this case, the surplus would be the workers themselves. So minimum wage is a price floor, and like rent control is a divisive issue. Well, why is it a divisive issue? Because it creates a surplus of labor. We don't exactly call it a surplus of labor, though rather we call it unemployment. So let's look a little closer as to how minimum wages actually work. So when we talk about the labor market, the supply of labor is provided by households. We provide labor as one of the factors of production. So when we look at our supply and demand, you can see that the supply of labor is here and that the demand for labor is here. With no controls in place in the market, then the supply you'll see and the, the price there equal out, which means that everybody who wanted a job could get a job because within this perfectly competitive market, we see supply and demand determining the wage and the number of workers at a particular wage. So demand is then a behavior of the firm. So instead of we saying price, we're actually saying wage. So when we look at it here, our wage is just over 450 an hour. So let's just say 451 an hour. So that's our hourly wage. So with no minimum wage, let's say the hourly wage is 460. So at that rate, there's no unemployment in the market. So you'll see here the number of workers. So 520 people are then employed at the equilibrium wage. So a market with no minimum wage is 100%. And minimum wages create equity at the expense of efficiency. So understand that a market with no minimum wage is 100% efficient. Everybody has a job. Minimum wages create equity at the expense of efficiency though. So when we look here at some of these different minimum wage rates, you'll notice the numbers are different. That's primarily because of states with no basic minimum wage law, which is like Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, they're paying the government minimum. Whereas these other states, you'll see wage more than federal, wage the same as federal. So they bump these numbers up. So the numbers are different depending on where you live. So let's look at this in particular, minimum wages and unemployment. Okay, so here's our demand for labor. Now here's our supply of labor. Now notice our wages are hourly and our quantity of labor is in the millions. So our minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. So at minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, there's our quantity supplied of labor. So we'll notice it's over $7 million. So at $7.25 an hour, 730 million people want a job. So here's our quantity demanded of labor though. Our firms at $7.25 an hour are only willing to hire 310 million people at that hourly wage. So 730 million minus 310 million, this is our surplus, equals a four, surplus of 420 million workers. Now remember, this is a hypothetical market, of course. So this is the surplus of labor, or what we would call unemployment. So surplus labor is unemployment. And when we look at unemployment, we look at it from a percentage perspective. Okay, so now I want to look in a little more detail at minimum wage, of course. So in markets where the labor is non-specialized and requires little training, there is a large surplus of labor. So understand a minimum wage only affects markets in which the labor is non-specialized and requires little training. As a result, there's a huge amount of people who are eligible for those jobs and therefore there's a large surplus of labor. There's not a huge demand for labor in that market though. And there doesn't have to be because there's such a large surplus. So the value of the goods produced by minimum wage is also much lower than that of specialized labor. So not only in these markets are workers non-specialized and there's not a huge demand for them, but at the same time, the product that they produce is, is not very valuable than that of specialized labor. So as minimum wage rises, so too does unemployment. Most notable, of course, among unskilled labor because that's the area in which pays the lowest. Now, and in particular, it's, it affects teenagers the most. So you look at this teenage, un teenage unemployment rate versus minimum wage increases from January of 2002 to February of 2010. Notice, of course, that as minimum wages increase, you'll notice that, of course, 
teenage unemployment increases as well. So when we hear all this talk of let's increase minimum wage, one of the things that that's going to affect is the number of teenagers actually able to get jobs. Okay, now we want to look here at a specialized labor market. So in markets where labor has specialized training, the supply is much smaller and inelastic. So we see this labor demand here, but if you notice the labor supply, the line is much steeper, the slope is a lot steeper. And the reason why is very simple, because when we start getting to specialized labor, we're talking about re increasing the educational level, so increasing human capital, but that also decreases the number of people eligible for those jobs. And as a result, we see a shrinking supply. So now minimum wage here is below equilibrium and the result is, is of course it's non-binding because in labor markets where the labor supply is inelastic, the value of the labor increases so that the, the floor is, is it's non-binding because these, wage, these laborers are going to get paid a higher wage. So here when minimum wage is $7.25 and this results in firm paying much larger wages to employ, to employ skilled laborers. So minimum wage is not binding. So now we see here a minimum wage that's much higher, a minimum wage of 725, yet we see labor being paid much higher than that because it's specialized labor. As with um, rent controls, uh, there exists a black market for labor as well. So the minimum wage increases the search activity for jobs. So you'll notice, of course, whenever we have an increase in search activity, there exists the opportunity for a black market to exist. So when we look at our labor demand here, we look at our labor supply, we have our minimum wage at 725. So here we have our quantity demanded of labor. We have our equilibrium. So notice when we draw the line down that what we see here is the lowest wage people are willing to work for. So we have a black market for labor because people are willing to work at less than minimum wage if they can get a job quicker. So much like rent controls, because of the search activity, we end up seeing people who are willing to work for less than minimum wage, or of course pay more for rent because of the search activity and the, the ability to of course decrease that search activity. So here we have this range of illegal, ra illegal wages that occurs because people are just, they wanna get a job. So if you're willing to work for the lower rate, you would find a job quicker than not. And let's look at calculating total revenue and price controlled markets. So when you talk about a price ceiling, the binding price ceilings are designed to help the consumer. The result for firms is a decrease in total revenue. <clears throat> and when you look at the graph, you've got this demand line here, and you've got supply here. So your equilibrium, which is where total revenue is, is $4 and then 5.5. So with no price control in place, you see a total revenue of $22. And when you add a price control in here at $2.50, you see with the price ceiling in place, price falls from $4 to $2.50 because that's the maximum that can be charged. What that does though is that causes quantity supplied to fall as well. So quantity supplied is the amount total revenue is measured by. And the reason for this is very simple. At that price, that's all they're willing to make. So you can't calculate total revenue by where the price crosses demand because that's just how much consumers want, but that's not what's actually available in the market. What's available in the market is this 350 here, this 3.5. So consumers purchase all that firms produce, but firms will only produce up to the ceiling. And that's because of that, that price. Remember as we, with supply, as prices increase, the quantity supply is going to increase. So our total revenue is equal to 250 times 3.5, which equals 875. And that shows us that loss. So when we see that line here, that, that tells us there that that 250 price, that's where our revenue is going to be at that point there where the price control crosses supply. So what effect does a price floor have on total revenue? Well, earlier we said it tends to increase total revenue, and that typically is the case. When we talk about price floors, what we notice here is binding price floors are designed to help producers. So the result for consumers is an increase in prices. So when we pull our supply and demand lines up, we'll notice here, same equilibrium, $4.550. So our total revenue, of course, is $22 again. Now, when we put a binding price floor in place of $5, though, we see a different effect. So with a price floor of $5, consumers see increased prices. So total revenue is $4 times 5.5, which equals $22 with no price control. Now with a price at 
fit at five dollars consumer demand falls but what happens to total revenue well total revenue is going to be five dollars times 4.5 which equals 2250 the reason why of course is because the only thing that the producer can sell is what consumers are willing to buy and with increased prices the amount that consumers are willing to buy declines and you'll notice where it falls there is where it crosses demand so price creates a slight increase in total revenue but remember they still must subtract total costs and thus profits aren't necessarily going to rise so we measure from QD because at the higher price we can only count on what consumers actually purchase and of course that number is we'll see here at 4.5 times 5.